I've been an academic and a, a part-time barrister specializing in EU law for most of my career. And since 2019, I am indeed a member of the European Parliament, which has fulfilled all my very worst expectations. Right? Uh, now, what shall I be talking about today? Primarily, the EU. Uh, but more particularly, The Strange Death of Europe. You know, that's the title of a well-known book by Douglas Murray. Uh, that title will be an appropriate epitaph for the tombstone of our continent, I fear, except to add, it's the strangest death by suicide ever we are experiencing here. Uh, that death will be the topic of my talk today. I intend to speak for around, well, I suspect about 40 minutes, so uh, we'll have some time for questions and answers, I think. Um, as I said, I've been an M MEP only since 2009, before I was an academic here in London. I taught European law in London and before that political, legal and moral theory as well as law in Ox at Oxford. My original intention when I accepted Andrew's invitation to address you today uh, was to talk about Brexit. Now, Brexit was an astonishing event. Um, I kind of campaigned for it. I certainly wrote a number of articles while I was still an academic here. And I was enthused when it actually happened, unexpected as it came to almost everyone. Uh, The campaign behind it, which made the victory possible, was extraordinary and astonishing achievement, really. And Boris Johnson displayed, I mean, whatever is false, displayed very clever maneuvering and acumen to seal the Brexit process with a trade deal. However, whether Brexit will really turn out to be an historical event of real importance uh, depends on whether or not it contributes to the dissolution of the European Union and whether the UK does not in the end follow the EU's rogue policies. Uh, for the time being, I think it appears as if the UK is doing so, although the UK has one advantage, it saved at least the money it used to transfer to Brussels. Now my own view, provisional view, is that Brexit might yet turn out to be an event of some historical importance because Britain's exit from the European Union leaves Germany as the only sizable country bankrolling the entire and growing European Union. Uh, am I being heard fairly clearly now? Yeah? yeah. Good. Okay. Um, now, the German political establishment uh, suffers from delusions of adequacy. Uh, they think that Germany is economically omnipotent and in a fiscal position similar to the US after the Second World War. Uh, delusions of adequacies, I think only the Germans are prone to, I think. Now, however, the Germans will defend the Euro, I'm sure, and the whole European Union, like the Eastern Front, The story is a familiar one, you know. Germany had effectively lost the war in 1943, but because the Germans were such good fighters and were willing to sacrifice everything, it went on for two more years, two years which were the bloodiest ever. The Italians got out in 1943, that was much wiser. Uh, at the same time, however, Brexit, especially after Trump's loss of the presidency, can hardly be described as a turning point in the general direction of Western historical development. Broadly spe speaking, apart from Britain's exit from the EU, Britain continues to move in unison with the EU, and that means forward in the wrong direction. Although less fast than Europe, and with some variations. From here on, I shall primarily speak about the EU, but Britain, you will see as I go along, is no exception to many of these 
lamentable trends. First, migration. The EU Commission is currently proposing a new EU migration pact which will transpose key elements of the Global Compact for Migration 2018 into EU law. Uh, the Global Contact, uh, Compact for Migration, I suspect the government, the British government, will have signed it too, is a, a, a theoretically non-binding international agreement which effectively postulates everyone's right to migrate. It blurs the distinction between legal and illegal migration. It only talks about irregular migration and it intimates that climate change being a sufficient asylum ground, right? So um, it's a catastrophic document. The AFD in Germany, that was before I became an active politician, but I was somewhat involved in it uh, uh, on the margins. Uh, the AFD in the Bundestag in, late two th in the second half of 2018, uh, led by uh, Gottfried Curio and Martin Hebner, who's now sadly deceased, two M, uh, MPs, um, uh, uh, almost single-handedly um, raised public awareness about this document. The idea Merkel had was to just sort of hush-hush, get it all over and done with, no one would notice. Uh, she even got the uh, now head of the uh, German Constitutional Court uh, to, uh, to make a statement, then still a CDU politician, that all this is just nice words, uh, no legal force. Now, as Constitutional Court President, he will at some stage in the not too distant future, I suspect, be asked to rule on some of the, uh, 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 on the legality of some aspects of the EU version of that pact. Now, the Global Compact of Migration, I said, blurs the distinction between refugees and migrants. No longer talks about illegal, but only about irregular migration. Almost everyone, i.e. nearly four, perhaps 4.5 million migrants who've entered the EU since 2015 have entered Europe illegally. They claimed and generally obtained refugee status when most of them were not entitled to it and had no right to enter the EU lawfully. Rather than confining migration to those groups which can show that they meet the criteria of the Gen uh, Geneva Refugee Convention of 1951, which is the relevant, almost solely relevant document in migration law, uh, so rather than confining migration to those groups which can actually prove they are refugees, the EU is now proposing um, expedited asylum procedures, safe pathways into Europe, especially from the Middle East and Africa, and an extension of the concept of family reunification from children and parents to siblings, half-siblings, and uncles and aunts. If adopted against the opposition of, of course, minority parties as yet in the West, but some of the governments of Eastern Europe too, if adopted against their opposition, the EU Migration Pact will push up immigration from hundreds of thousands every year to, million, to millions. The EU is planning to attract most future migrants, and I'm not joking, from Africa. With this objective, the EU Commission President, uh, President uh, uh, EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, has adopted a new EU Africa strategy, which contains a mobility and migration partnership between the EU and Africa which in her own words, or in her own words, she said, uh, Africa will from now on be the EU's preferred partner in most policy fields. Uh, so, digitalization, for example. <laughs> right? Uh, 
but perhaps uh, reproductive energy too. Right. Well, anyway. Um, so, um, the EU Parliament also recently called for the recognition of the right to an abortion as a human right and for the inclusion of climate change as one of the internationally recognized grounds for asylum. That would mean that anyone who doesn't like the weather in his, <laughs> in his own country, I suppose theoretically it would include Ireland, but then they have free movement to the UK already. But, um, so anyone who doesn't like the weather uh, in his own country, or any woman who tried but could not obtain an abortion at home will have a right to claim asylum in the EU. And by the time the woman arrives, the child will be two years old. Because the EU is paying her accommodation and child benefit, she may well go on to have two, three, four, five children. In Africa alone, there are 40 million new births every year. The average Central African woman has somewhere around five children, including the infertile ones. Africa's population will double by 2050 and reach about 2.5 billion. Practically all of these would, under the EU's current plans, be entitled to settle in Europe. According to some Gallup poll, even today, around 700 million Africans would like to move. If only 2% of those 2.5 billion, they'll be in 2050, will actually come here, this would mean 50 million. And whereas our women, our indigenous women, have around 1.2 or 1.4 children on average, the immigrants will have three or four. Even without further immigration, the native populations of Western Europe, which in France, Belgium, Sweden, or Germany, still account for, our, for somewhere between uh, 70 and perhaps 82% of the population now, will cease to be the majority between 2040 and 2050 because their countries are becoming 0.5 to 0.8% less indigenous every year because of the birth rate differential between the immigrant population and the indigenous population. If immigration continues, and that's the EU's firm intention, I say continue, but really if it accelerates, then Europeans will be in a minority by 2035, possibly by 2030. Second topic, climate change. Since Merkel met mad young Greta Thunberg at an airport lounge, you remember the pictures, Merkel was queuing up to pay homage to the sage. And since Merkel's loyal Lieutenant von der Leyen took over as Commission President, the EU has gone climate crazy. According to the latest scheme entitled Fit for 55, the EU aims to cut all CO2 emissions uh, by 55% by 2030. Uh, by then, all diesel cars will have been scrapped by 2050, the e EU aims to be fully climate neutral. Long before then, petrol cars would have disappeared, electricity and heating bills would have risen exponentially, and industry would incur vastly higher energy bills, although the brunt of the rising energy costs will be borne by the consumer. Which will not, who will not profit from subsidies. Green cars, uh, cars will still be allowed, but only the very rich can afford them. I know you've had a whole lecture by a leading expert and skeptic in the field of climate craze, and I do not wish to go uh, over the same material again. 
Let me therefore now briefly turn to the third and final, final policy field uh, where the EU has run amok. Uh, its, policy, its policy response to the COVID virus wave, virus wave I say, because the term pandemic is really a bit out of place here. We're not talking about uh, the Black Death. The COVID wave, virus wave, has cost far fewer lives than officially suggested because everyone was classified as a COVID dead if he died with COVID. Um, and uh, it may be no higher than a medium severe flu or influenza wave in some years. Uh, now, I wish to confine myself to four aspects of the COVID phenomenon. First, on average, GDP in EU countries collapsed by something between 5 to 12 percent, with Sweden, which resisted lockdowns uniquely, really, at the lower end. Public debt, in turn, increased by about 8 to nearly 15 percent. And those figures ignore the 800 billion euros the EU has borrowed to support member states in addition to the money the member states have raised themselves. And in violation of its own treaty, the EU treaties, two treaty provisions, provisions clearly state that the EU budget, budget must be balanced every year and the EU uh, isn't allowed to uh, um, uh, issue debt uh, on the international markets. So in violation of at least two treaty provisions, the EU last year, um, uh, 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 masterminded by von der Leyen, uh, uh, issued debt of no less than 800 billion euros that's nowhere accounted for, neither in the member states' budgets, nowhere in the EU's budget. Second, the EU has suffered greater economic decline than any other region in the world but its death figures are the highest in the world together with those in Britain and uh, the US, and now I think increasingly Russia too. Uh, third, infection and death figures have indeed come down compared to last year, but to levels we would have expected without vaccination because many have had the disease, in many cases without symptoms, Many of those most at risk have by now died, sometimes because of the treatments administered to them. We also know the vaccines offer only limited protection, sometimes have serious side effects, and their long-term risks are unknown. So rates have come down, infection and death rates, but they are now roughly what we would expect uh, as more as, as societies reach herd immunity. They say it's due to vaccination. At best, it now seems the vaccine is having a fairly neutral effect. Right? Uh, that's where we are. I mean, I'm not entirely certain, but the evidence that it's doing wonders is very slim and flimsical indeed. Um, Third, following COVID, the EU has adopted some of the most repressive measures ever seen in Western states, including wartime, lockdowns, curfews, a suspension of freedoms of, a, of assembly and of speech, massive censure, uh, censorship and deplatforming, and a de facto mandatory vaccination campaign. The unvaccinated have lost many freedoms, which they can only assert for three days, when they get tested. I do that every day, uh, every week in the European Parliament. I have to have two damn tests now because, uh, I mean, getting into Britain is actually the easiest thing at all. Uh, if I take the Eurostar, I don't have to produce a test any longer, but soon we'll have to produce a test just to get into the European Parliament. The French take it very seriously, and in Italy, of course, um, uh, you now have to, uh, uh, have a COVID pass, and generally that means you have to be vaccinated in order to go to work. If you're not vaccinated, you have to test. Tests are no longer free of charge. So in Italy, you've effectively got to pay to go to work. It can cost anything up to five or 600 euros a month. 
if you do the test every two or three days as is required. Uh, there are demonstrations now against it. Uh, the media, at least in Germany, are generally talking about um, pro-government uh, uh, demonstrations uh, against fascism and the right wing, right? Uh, yes. I mean, yeah, hundreds of thousands, allegedly, according to the um, uh, 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 German media. Now, all this is madness, but though this be madness, there's, mes uh, uh, there's method in its complete economic nonsense. First, I'm now revisiting the three issues I dealt with, uh, and I'm, in a sense, briefly trying to assess uh, what sense, of any, the EU's approach in these fields makes. Uh, first, migration. We are told we need more workers, but most migrants which have come to Germany since 2015, or even before, don't work. The demographer and financial economist Bernd Raffelhuschen, I think he teaches in Freiburg, uh, calculated that the two million migrants which entered Germany between uh, 2015 and 2018 will cost the German taxpayer the colossal sum of at least 900 billion or nearly one trillion euros over their lifetime. That means 20 billion every year. Since then, Germany has had about another one million migrants and newborns of migrants, which may cost more because they have a higher life expectancy than the 40 years, which Raffelhuschen assumed would be the remaining life on average of the migrants that entered between 2015 and 18. Moreover, Raffelhuschen's figures are now generally assumed to be far too low, and 40 billion per year for 2 million migrants is probably far more realistic. Even that is a, an estimate uh, which considerably falls short of some of the figures I've seen. That means about 60 billion every year for 3 million. The EU, of course, is planning not to repatriate, but to import more migrants. Possibly, we put that figure to the EU Commission and they didn't deny it, possibly 70 million by two, 2035. But even without 70 million, our societies, as I said, are becoming less European by the day at a rate of close to 1%, somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8% every year. The result of all that will be a collapse of the welfare state and European societies will come to resemble that of Brazil with a vast amorphous mass and a small largely white plutocratic elite coupled with a bit of social control modeled on China. Second, the cost of climate change policies will be just as dramatic. Initially, hundreds of billions every year, uh, which will be borne primarily by households and smaller companies. At the same time, the effect of the EU's climate rescue policies will be minuscule, as the EU only contributes slightly over 6% to worldwide CO2 emissions. Other countries will not follow the EU's follies. Their costs will be lower, and their competitive advantage will ensure Europe's share of worldwide exports will decline rapidly. The EU's domestic market will be protected as foreign exporters to the EU have to pay climate tariffs. Consumers, however, will bear the brunt of ever more expensive imports. Europe will be a high-cost internal market for low-income people, with goods for social security recipients. All this will be financed by inflation and higher taxes. The middle classes will be depleted, and society will divide into a large poor mass in high-rise buildings where they are kept like chickens in batteries, but laying, laying no eggs, where electricity 
is rationed and space is limited, and a small financial globalist elite is governing them with no loyalty to anyone. Third, sorry, is it a yes. dissent? Oh, I said no, right. Third, the COVID crisis has shown that social control can be almost all embracing if governments really mean it and get serious. Rest assured that many of the measures which were adopted during the crisis can be reintroduced if a new scare is manufactured and mass hysteria will fuel repression. The World Economic Forum has provided us with a glimpse of the world it envisages in a video by the Danish eco-warrior Ida Auken. It's still available on the internet, although the WEF has taken it off because after it was shown um, on their website for a few days, there was such outrage that they took it off. Nonetheless, they've never distanced themselves from the video and they're still producing uh, lots of material which essentially uh, uh, says the same thing. It's slightly better packaged now. But if you Google a bit, um, the, world in two, the World by 2030 and then Ida Auken, A-U-K-E-N, and World Economic Forum, you'll come across it. The only copy I've still been able to locate is one by the, uh, is somewhere on Facebook. I've still got it, so if anyone just can't find it, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, uh, you can find my email on the, on the um, um, uh, 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 web, obviously, at the European Parliament. Now, the World Economic Forum video makes eight predictions which can be uh, narrowed down to the following. First, most people will own nothing. Goods are either provided free of charge or are borrowed from the state or big corporations, and everyone will be happy. <laughs> it's true, I mean, that's what they say. Uh, uh, the world will be governed by a small number of large states and organizations like the EU, how reassuring. Third, meat consumption will become a luxury. Its price will be fixed globally at extremely high levels. Fourth, Western values like democratic self-government and the rule of law will be tested to the limit. I mean, I'm trying to keep to their sort of wording as far as possible. Um, fifth, there will be massive and historically unprecedented movements of people into Europe and the US. I'm sparing you the, th the, the sixth point, namely that um, worms and insects will be our main source of proteins. Right. No, no, I mean, my nephew, who's about 13 in German school, is already being taught about this, that really they're extremely healthy, those two things. Um, now, uh, uh, admittedly, that's a German school. All German schools are now, at least in West Germany, I mean, that's the part of Germany which is, frankly, lost. East Germany is better, but West Germany is a serious problem. All uh, high. Uh, uh, schools called gymnasia are now called uh, schools against, with courage and against racism. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, fortunately, 13-year-olds are still making fun of this, right? Uh, uh, it will be a world here described by the World Economic Forum in which most people will have lost their private property due to high taxes, inflation, poor incomes or unemployment, or in which they've never had any property. They will live, in a, uh, they will live on a state-provided basic income, ensuring their survival. This process may not be completed by 2030, but we are heading in this direction that should be obvious to everyone who's ever taken a look at central bank policy. Welcome to the brave new world full of epsilons, which will be Brazil plus, uh, uh, Brazil plus a bit of China, but without the weather. Or maybe with the weather, because the effect of the EU's policy on the climate will be nil. You may think this is all very fan fanciful. 
But who in this room would have thought in, say, February 2020 that we would see mon months-long uh, lockdowns of the economy, curfews, travel bans, 90% reductions in air travel, and six-fold increases in energy prices in the spot, the spot markets, all these within less than two years. If we are not seeing widespread civil disobedience soon, our freedoms risk being lost forever, very soon, and so will be almost anything that makes life worth living. There's more to life than mere existence, yet our governments think otherwise. They want us to graze like cattle, chewing over their medicine forever and ever. I say we, because while the UK government might not seem quite as mad as the EU, it's heading, as I said before, firmly in the same direction. Uh, thank you for your attention, and then hopefully... Then maybe we have some time for questions. Yes. Yeah. Is that okay. Questions. <laughs>